Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started with this program. This track is sponsored by NC Cardinal with live captioning made possible by Equinox Open Library Initiative. And we'd like to thank our captioner. We'd also like to thank the other conference sponsors for making this event possible, Mobius, Bibliomation, and Evergreen Indiana. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube following the conclusion of the conference. We'd like to encourage everyone to use the chat window to post questions. The facilitators will be collecting your questions along the way and posing them to the presenter at the end of the session or when she asks for questions. We'd like to introduce Michelle Morgan from Noble, the North of Boston Library Exchange, who will be presenting If This, Then That. Action triggers are more than just notices. Okay, thanks, April. Um, <clears throat> Um, as you may have guessed, my name is Michelle Morgan, uh, and I'm the technical support analyst at Noble, uh, the North of Boston Library Exchange. Um, just to give you a little context, um, here's a quick slide about our Noble libraries. Um, we have 17 public libraries, eight academics, and one special library, um, and we're situated north of Boston in Massachusetts. Um, so when we talk about action triggers, um, we need to maintain those uh, for all our libraries. Uh, so one question is, what do action triggers do? Um, well, they do a lot. Uh, um, they send a lot of email notices, um, overdues, uh, messages related to holds, um, welcome messages for new patrons, uh, messages for soon to expire patron records to remind them to update their accounts. Um, password reset emails are action triggers, as well as uh, when you email yourself a bibliographic record from the catalog, that's an action trigger. Um, the checkout receipts in the web client, those are generated by an action trigger. Um, there are, if you have them enabled, there are SMS or text action triggers that can send hold ready for pickup messages. Um, there is a stock trigger for an SMS courtesy notice when your items are due uh, in the next few days. Um, and you can also text yourself call numbers from the OPAC. Acquisitions makes heavy use of triggers, which I'm not going to talk about because I don't understand them and that's a whole presentation in itself. Um, also, um, action triggers do things like process auto renewals, if your system uses that, uh, mark items lost or long overdue, and that involves billing a patron for an item that they've had out too long. Um, if you use the evergreen self-check, the built-in one, the receipts generated by the self-check are action triggers. Um, lots of the print functions in the web client in the, in the OPAC have an action trigger underneath them. Um, you can use action triggers to put a message for a patron in their account when they log into the catalog in the message center. Um, Vandalay or mark import export functions use a lot of triggers uh, and all the emergency closing processing is um, done by triggers. So I want to start by looking at all the bits and pieces that um, that uh, go into triggers. Um, so if you have permission, and that's a big question, um, action triggers uh, send a lot of email, so you really want to think about who has permission to get into them uh, and change them. <clears throat> but if you do have permission uh, and you go to administration, local administration, uh, and choose notifications slash action triggers, you get this screen, um, which is uh, has all your event definitions listed here. Um, and some of them probably look familiar. Uh, this is a stock uh, system, um, but you can see it has courtesy notices and overdue notices and, and auto renew is here. <clears throat> um, so this tabs across the top, we're looking at the event definitions. Um, the next tab are the hooks and that's the if this part. So 
Um, what the hooks do is they, um, some of them listen to whatever Green is doing, and if um, an event happens in Evergreen, like somebody checks out an item, that is a hook, and you could use that to make Evergreen do something based on that checkout. Um, each hook has what's called a core type, and that's um, a data source in Evergreen. Um, it, it's a, the name of a class in the field mapper or fmidl.xml file, which we will look at later. Um, there's a description here, which is pretty good um, to give you an idea of what they do. Uh, and this column, um, passive, uh, most of these are not passive triggers. There's only one here that is a passive trigger. And the difference is um, the triggers that aren't passive, uh, an action has to be done in order for them to happen. Like you click on a print button in the catalog to print a bib record. Um, and that's an active trigger. A passive trigger is, <clears throat> excuse me, when you have like a checked out item that's due in three days, um, those, the system recognizes those as time passes. So you can have, you can use the checkout due trigger and look for something that is due in three days, like for a courtesy notice. And when that becomes true, that's when that trigger gets activated. Excuse me. Um, the next tab is the reactors, and that's the then that part. Um, so based on, on those hooks, you can make something happen. Uh, a lot of the things you make happen are you send emails, um, but there's a lot of other things that can be the reactor for your triggers. Uh, and the next tab is the validators. And this is important because you could have situations where um, something was true when you, um, when your trigger was generated, but by the time it's time to process it, it's not true anymore. So we always want to check and make sure the initial condition was still true before we send that email for something that somebody already returned. So if we go back to the event definitions, um, each name of the definition is a link. Uh, so if I click on, say, this three-day courtesy notice that's at the top, I get another set of tabs. Um, the first one is the environment. Um, and the environment, um, it makes data available to your template. Uh, so if you are sending an email message, you're you're taking pieces of data from Evergreen, and you need to make sure that your action trigger knows where that data is coming from. Um, it uses paths defined in the fmidl.xml, also known as the field mapper. Um, and getting the environment right is important, because if you leave something out um, and you call for this data in your template, it's going to be blank. There's going to be not, nothing there. Also, if you if you put it in there wrong, um, it's going to cause your your trigger to fail, um, and nothing will run. So here's an example of an environment that we use in our, our two week overdue notice, and in any of our act notices that actually deal with with items. Um, and our goal here is to print um, every piece of the call number with its prefix and suffix uh, and parts um, if they're in use. Um, so how do you fill in these paths? Um, I have a few brief slides here. It's, um, if there's time at the end, we can look in more detail um, at the field mapper. Uh, but I just cut and pasted pieces of the field mapper, hopefully to give you an idea of how to get those, those pieces of data. Um, so in the, in the checkout do hook, it's looking at uh, the data source known as circ, which is a circulation. Um, and one of the things that the circulation links to is the target copy, the item that's checked out. Um, and that shows as a link. And further down in the definition, that link is defined. Um, so target copy links to another data source called ACP. Uh, 
And if we go find that data source, ACP, um, which is the copy, um, here is the database table name that it points to. Um, one of the fields in there is call number, which is also a link. So if we follow that down further in the definition, that takes us to the class ACN. So when we go there, we see uh, here is the label, which is what we're looking for. Uh, and that is a text. That's not another link. So we're as far in the environment as we need to go. We can just grab that text for our template. So if we add to our environment uh, target copy dot call number to the environment, um, we can call in our template circ target copy call number and end with the label, which is right here. So you can spend all day finding paths through the, the IDL, but if you want data in your templates, um, it's a good thing to know. Um, okay, the other, another tab here is uh, parameters. Now, many of the uh, triggers don't have parameters. Um, this particular one is a mark long overdue trigger. And that does things like uh, changes the status of an item to long overdue. So um, you need an editor variable to be able to do that. So that's why that's there. Um, this is a good tab to know about because um, it lets you do a test of a trigger if you're working on it um, by having a barcode of a checked out copy. So you could check an item out to yourself and plug that barcode in here. And if it's an email trigger, um, when you press go, you'll get an email, uh, a, te a, a, a test email that shows you what your output is going to look like. It will also show on the screen, um, but it looks a little weird. The formatting is weird, but you will get the email if that's the way your trigger is set up. Uh, okay, so back to the event definitions. Um, if you double click on one of these rows, like the first one, um, you get a whole list of fields. Uh, that you can configure for your uh, event definition. This is a three-day courtesy notice. Um, we already talked about the hook. Uh, it's enabled. Uh, processing delay and max event validity delay work together um, also with the due date. Uh, so what this is saying is uh, for this uh, event definition, we want to look at items that are checked out and due uh, between two days from now and three days from now. Um, and we're going to act on those items and send the person an email to let them know that their items are due soon. Uh, our validator is the item still checked out. Um, the definition ID, uh, that's how the database keeps track of, of where this event lives. Um, we'll look at that a little more later. Um, granularity we'll look at later too. For this one, it's blank. Um, I'm just going to go through the rest of the fields here because we'll talk about them later. Um, you can also add a message using a trigger. Those are the fields for that. Um, you can also do opt-in triggers, which we'll talk about later, and set retention intervals also later. Um, but then we come to the template, which is the, the part that actually generates the message that goes to your patron. Uh, so if you look at that a little closer, um, these are written in template toolkit. Uh, the little things between the square brackets with the parentheses are template toolkit commands and they can assign variables or call data. Uh, but interspersed, you can see there's just plain text. So there's, there's a lot that you can do here without knowing much template toolkit. Uh, for example, if we look at this, um, this salutation, it says, dear user family name, comma, user first name. So it says, dear Jones, comma, Bob. Well, maybe I want that to say, dear Bob Jones instead. Um, so I, if I just swap those around, whoops. Okay, I missed something. <laughs> oh, maybe that's later. Sorry, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, this slide uh, talks about some helpers that you can use in your TT2 um, templates. Uh, there's a way that you can format a date. 
in a number of different ways. Uh, there's a helper that will get the copy price. Um, and what it knows how to do is go to the copy, uh, find the price if it's there. If it's zero, it will look at the library setting that will uh, allow you to have a default price and it will use that instead. So it knows how to do that. Uh, there's also a helper that can get basic information about the items that are that you're going to print in your templates, uh, like title information, author information. You can get org unit settings with a helper. Um, you can get user settings from a patron record, like the uh, default SMS or text number that the patron has as a user setting. And you can also, <coughs> excuse me, generate the SMS gateway email with a helper. Um, Okay, so we're going to look a little deeper under the hood. Um, first, we're going to look at some database tables. Uh, and these are the database tables that um, relate to action triggers. And a lot of them you'll recognize. Uh, the event definition is what we were looking at in the client. Um, as a matter of fact, most of these we already looked at through the client's eyes, which is fine, but there are a couple that we that we didn't see there. Um, the first one is called event. So action trigger event has these fields. Um, and this is really the important one because when we're doing the three day uh, courtesy notice and we've gathered about 50 items that need to be processed to send these messages, each one of those 30 items is going to generate a row in the event table. Um, <coughs> and the action trigger process will, will work through those rows and, and uh, process them. The other table we didn't see in the client is the event output table. And this data field is where the generated email actually lives in the database. So um, you can access that if you need to. And you also need to be aware that um, that could be sensitive data. So um, I mean, it's safely tucked in the database, but it's, it's worth noting that that data needs to be managed. Uh, just briefly, here's the event definition table. And I'm not going to talk about this because it looks it mirrors exactly what we were looking at in the client. Um, okay, and I do want to apologize uh, for this next slide, but I wanted to try and give you an idea of how these tables all link together. Um, here's the event table. Uh, this is the one that contains those 30 items that need a pre-do notice. Um, and <clears throat> it has a state and as the triggers run, uh, this row changes and reflects different states of the trigger. Um, it points back to the event by its uh, definition ID, which in this case is 381. Um, the event links to the hook reactor, I'm sorry, the event definition links to the hook reactor and validator, uh, like we saw before, and also the environment um, by its ID. Uh, and notice that the event table has a template output field, and that has an ID for um, the event output table. So that links those together. Um, and one thing I want to call your attention to before we leave this slide is um, the event ID, which is something like 35 million, 500,000, et cetera. Um, so remember that number for later. Uh, okay, so uh, more under the hood are the Perl modules. Um, when you have the uh, reactors and validators, those all point back to uh, these Perl modules uh, that are in the Evergreen code. Um, so yet another piece is the cron tab, um, which tells Evergreen when do you want to run these triggers? When do you want to see when items are due in three days? 
Um, this, I think, is pretty much a stock one, uh, the example one that Evergreen comes with. Uh, and by default, it will run all the triggers um, every half an hour, which is fine. Um, further on down here, uh, the stock granularities, um, if you want to run them at different intervals, like hourly, daily, weekly, uh, et cetera. So those are all there. Um, and the third cron tab entry here is the, is the one that purges the old events, <clears throat> which we'll talk about more a little later. Um, okay, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, one more piece. Um, you can also use uh, custom filters to limit, um, to limit the events that are generated. For example, you might not want to create an email action trigger if the patron doesn't have an email address because it's going to sit in your database and it's going to end up invalid. So why have it in the first place? You can also use triggers, I'm sorry, filters to send notices only to certain categories of patrons uh, based on the data in the patron record. Um, <coughs> and it's nice to use filters to avoid creating events, events that are just going to end up in an invalid status at the end. So uh, filters use JSON query syntax, and I have a couple of examples of filters that, that we use in Noble. Um, the first one is the one that we use for processing auto renewals. Uh, we have uh, libraries that opt into auto renewals and some do not. So uh, the top is just the basic filter that Evergreen comes with, with for auto renewals. Um, but down here, we're saying only run this for um, circulations that have uh, in the circ lib, which is the place where it was checked out, um, these org unit numbers. Um, and the other thing we have in here is if there, there's an auto renewal remaining field in the circ row in the database, if that is null, we don't want to process this trigger at all because some things, some circulations are just not renewable. And when the trigger processes and it fails, by default, it will send an email to a patron saying, hey, this non-renewable item, I couldn't auto-renew it. So we just don't want those to go. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Here's another filter that we use. Um, for our patron welcome messages. Um, we have public libraries and academic libraries. And for the academic libraries, mostly their student records are loaded from the bursar. So we don't want to send them a welcome message um, because they'll get that information from what well, we don't want. We don't want Evergreen to send them a welcome message. Um, so we limit that by uh, patron profile and also by <clears throat> the home library of the patron record. Uh, another filter, uh, this is for an overdue notice that we created for reserve items. Uh, we had an academic library that wanted a notice to go out the next day for a reserve item. Um, and like anything when you're, when you're um, configuring things. There are a number of different ways that, that you can do it, but the way that was the most straightforward was for this library whose org unit is 30, uh, in the CERC table, look for any items that have a loan duration of two hours, which are their reserves. So we'll send uh, overdue notices the next day for those items. <clears throat> um, Okay, we can pause for questions. Uh, so let's see. Hey. Well, you you got a lot of commentary um, from everybody who loved your the slide that you apologized for and connecting <laughs> all the dots because everybody thought well, that was fantastic. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking it might be something you want to blow up and put on your wall, but yes. <laughs> I do like Some the said, couch throw. <laughs> yes, couch throw, cross stitch sampler. Yes. <laughs> and wow. then ben, Benjamin had a question. Um, so you have auto renewals turned on for everyone. 
but use this to prevent some systems from having their items auto renewed using the uh, filters? Well, yes, we use the filter in the trigger to um, to only yeah, I, I guess I yeah, I forgot about that part. You have to have the circ rules configured to do auto renewal. And also, <coughs> excuse me, the um the filter for the triggers um to limit the ones that are processed because yes, you don't want to try and process auto renewals for libraries that have not opted in. But that's opposed to building individual triggers for each library that is using auto renewal, which is how we've done it so um that's really yeah that, that's handy. true just like like anything else there are probably a million ways that you can do it um it just yeah. seemed the way we uh the way we instituted it it just seemed to grow sort of organically from a single trigger that we filtered yeah so, it makes you a could lot do sense. it either way yeah it makes a lot of sense way. that way <clears throat> anybody else have questions you want to type into chat or uh Let's see. Jennifer asks, where do you put the filter code in the template or somewhere else? Uh, okay, good question. The filter code does not go in the template. Um, we have a folder in OpenILS conf AT filters where all our filters live. Um, and then when you run the trigger, the code that runs the trigger can call the filter at the path where it lives. So it lives somewhere in the file system um that you can call in the command <clears throat> um, okay i'll move on and we can take more questions at the end um, so i have a few uh trigger tweaks um that i want to share uh this one was very uh this this one got used a lot disable a trigger um, when libraries started closing, we didn't want to send overdue notices, we didn't want to send pre-due notices, we didn't want to send hold notifications. So um, by opening up the trigger, unchecking the enabled box and saving it, um, your trigger won't run. So that's a good thing to know about. Um, okay, and here's the slide that I ta started talking about earlier, but it came later. Um, here's where I wanted to change the text from saying dear last name first name uh, to say dear first name last name um, and add a just a sentence at the bottom that gives them a link to the catalog where they can log in and manage their account. Um, <clears throat> uh, you can change the processing delay in a trigger. Uh, for this example, this is the hold ready for pickup. Uh, notification and um, by default the processing delay is 30 minutes and what that means is you check in an item it goes on your hold shelf um, that row in the event table is added but it is not allowed to process until half an hour has gone by and the idea is uh, you need to make sure you get it on the shelf because you know the patrons gonna walk in the door as soon as they receive that email message um if something if the item is in such a condition that you can't let it go for the hold you need time to like undo that hold so that by the time the hold not not notifications are processed the fact that it's on the hold shelf is no longer true so it needs so it will be marked invalid so that's the idea of a processing delay um if maybe 30 minutes is not enough or too long uh, you can change that. Um, maybe you need an hour. Uh, so you change that and save it. Um, <clears throat> and now um, the events, the whole notification events will sit in the event table for an hour before they are eligible to be processed for the, by the uh, cron tab. Um, okay, so let's look at uh, password resets. Um, so that's a trigger uh, and the default processing delay for this trigger is one second, which is great. We'd love those to go quick. Um, but 
by default, action triggers only run every 30 minutes. So if you happen to do your password reset and action triggers are going to run in a minute, you're good. You're going to get your email right away. But if action triggers have run a minute before you request your password reset, you're going to have to wait 29 minutes to get your email. So that's fixable. Um, what we did is we just run all our action triggers every two minutes. Um, so we changed our cron tab from 30 minutes to two minutes. Uh, so our password resets uh, will go out um, for no later than two minutes after they're requested. Uh, the other thing you could do is give your password reset trigger a granularity. Um, and it could be free text, it can be anything you want, preferably something that you recognize. And then you add a cron tab entry that um, refers to that granularity, pwd underscore reset is what I used. Um, <clears throat> uh, and that will run only your password reset notification every two minutes. Uh, OK, so here's a message center. Um, message that we have added to the long overdue action trigger. And the idea was you're charging a patron for a book that they've had for six weeks. Uh, you send them a notice, but it might be nice if they had a little more information, if they should log into their account and see that they owe money as to what that money is for. Um, so we added that and that is part of the trigger. So the trigger sends out the, the notice and also adds the, the message that the patron can see in the catalog when they log in. Um, we did a similar thing with the uh, car library account soon to expire uh, to try and let them know how they can renew their card. <clears throat> uh, OK, so why don't we pause for questions again? Let's see. So OK, I see Mike uh, pointed to the cron tab entry. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so yeah, as part of the command to run the trigger has to uh, refer to the filter. And we'll actually see something later. Um, OK, thanks, Jason, for pointing out the default action trigger filters. Um, yeah, silly autocorrect. <laughs> So Jessica says, we just reduced the daily, though the delay, sorry, for whole notices for a lot of libraries because a lot of libraries wanted to check the item out to the patron soon after the hold was triggered for curbside. Um, reduce the delay. So you wanted them to get a message um, that their hold was ready and then the checkout would happen. Oh, well, that's interesting. At least I think that's the, the goal. Huh. Okay, that's an that's interesting. That that should work. <coughs> um, okay, are there any other questions before I go on? <laughs> uh, I didn't see any more in the chat. Okay, great. Let's go on. Uh, let's talk about retention. Um, so in release 3.0, the ability to set a retention interval for um, action trigger events was introduced. Um, without those uh, retention intervals, that event table just gets bigger and bigger. Um, you remember that table with the uh, 35 million 500,000 ID that means that many events have been generated in this system. And if they're not getting purged, then they're gonna still be in your database. Taking up room, um, storing patron information that you don't want stored there. Um, <clears throat> so it's great to be able to uh, purge old events from the database. Uh, so to set that up, first thing you have to do is decide how long you want to retain things. Uh, we decided on six months for circulation notices, mostly because there are places in the, the client that, that display how many notices people have gotten. 
So um, to sort of have a record if you have a long a billing dispute that yes, we sent you notices, not that we should need to go. Well, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, most, most triggers though, um, we don't keep very long at all. Like if you print a record from the catalog, we don't wanna keep that longer than one day. If you do a password reset, we don't need to keep that. So once you've decided on your, your intervals, uh, you can add them to the event in the retention interval field. Um, and you make sure that the cron tab entry that purges the event is enabled. And then your database will be nice and clean. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, on to cloning triggers. You might want to create new triggers. Um, you can create new triggers from scratch, but it's much easier to clone a trigger that already exists because um, chances are you want to make some changes and have a trigger that's similar to one that you already have. So it's easier to, to clone. <clears throat> some cautions. Triggers love to send emails. So we want to avoid sending emails that we don't really mean to send. Um, so when you're working on triggers, a few ways to avoid doing that is um, if it's an e email trigger, you can change the reactor to process template for testing. <laughs> but then if you do want to see that output, you do need database access uh, so that you can query it to see what that looks like. You could, in your template, um, replace the email variable that gets the patron's email and hard code it with your own email address so that you'll get all the emails. Um, if you're working on a trigger over a period of time, uh, keep it disabled un unless you're actively working on it, just, just to avoid the possibility that it might run unintended. Um, you can always add a unique granularity so that the trigger won't be called by the cron tab. Um, it could be a nonsense thing, but just just say like, hey, I'm different than all the others. Um, <clears throat> and it's important uh, not to bite off more than Evergreen can chew. Um, if you decide you want a trigger that uses um, a large interval between the processing delay and the max validity, you could generate a whole bunch of events that your system can't handle. Yes, I've done that, <laughs> but only once or twice. Um, Ideally, uh, use a test server to do your testing and then uh, copy things from one server to another. Uh, okay, so the process of cloning triggers, um, you have a checkbox next to the trigger, uh, you click clone, but I've always find, found that when you do it the first time, not all the fields get filled in. So I do that, I click cancel, and then I do it again. Um, and then I get my fields filled in, except granularity, I never get that to fill in, but that's fine, I can always go back and fix that. So um, what we did, uh, we used to have one hold notification trigger for the entire network. Um, and some libraries want them turned on at different times than others at this point. So we've been cloning them. Um, this is the system-wide trigger. Um, I can change it to just be owned by one library. Um, in the default text, we can just replace um, <clears throat> replace uh, the default text with text that libraries want, say, ask, encouraging people to call so that they can arrange a pickup appointment. <clears throat> so when you save it, uh, it will ask you if you want to clone the event definition uh, environment. And sure, why would you not? <laughs> uh, <coughs> okay, so when you're working with triggers, there are some strategies you can use to test and monitor. Um, I mentioned the test by barcode. Those work for like the overdue triggers, the pre-due triggers, the ones that use circulation. So that's a handy thing. Uh, to be able to do. Um, and that also works if your trigger is disabled. So you can keep your trigger disabled and keep tweaking it and use this uh, testing uh, box 
uh, to get the, the output in your email. Um, so here's uh, a way to run um, a trigger from the command line. Uh, this is a shell script, um, which actually uh, it just copied a little piece from the the uh, the cron tab, and here's the actual trigger that runs. Um, so here's the granularity uh, that I have in the trigger, uh, and here's the reference to the custom filter that I have for this trigger. Um, and uh, so if you're running a big trigger, um, I like to I like to monitor it to see how those events are churning. Um, maybe to see, to make sure that I haven't bitten off more than Evergreen can chew. So if I run this uh, query, uh, I use I use PG admin and I was very sad to hear that it's deprecated. Uh, but if you run that, uh, you can see how the events um, are getting processed. So when events are created, they start as pending and they go through states like uh, collecting, collected, uh, there are a number of um, states, but ideally they all end up as complete. Um, so when your trigger is done, this is what it looks like. <clears throat> uh, oh, Blake says PG admin four is alive and well. That's good to hear. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is a way you can monitor your triggers. Um, if you are, if you have um, changed your reactor to process template from um, send email, then your the output that you want to see is sitting in the database. This is a query that can get at that. Uh, it will select data from the output table. Um, and it's probably a sloppy query. There's probably a better way that you can do it, but it, it works for me. Um, Okay, I'm going to go through the rest um, and then we can do questions at the end. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is the opt in triggers. Um, you can make triggers such that patrons have the option to opt in. Um, in order to do that, you need a user setting type. Um, we created uh, three different user setting types because we wanted patrons to be able to opt in to getting a pre due notice that was seven days before the due date, one that was five days before the due date, and one that was on the day that the item was due. Um, so we created those. Um, and then you need to add those uh, settings to your template. Um, so here's the user setting and you need this opt-in user field um, just because if you don't have it, uh, I forget what happens, but it was something bad. So you need that. <laughs> uh, so when you've done that um, and you go to the patron registration screen, you will see choices uh, that you can opt patrons in to those triggers. Um, patrons will also see those in the catalog. They can check them off and save them. Um, so we've been doing that for quite a while and um, they seem to work out well. Um, a few more uh, tips, tricks, and examples. Uh, we have libraries that regularly do food for fines uh, during the holidays. Um, so it was always kind of a pain. Sure, I'm happy to add this to their trigger, but then I have to remember to take it out again. So by putting in uh, a conditional and using the date um, that using the current date and comparing it with when we want the trigger to stop, we say if if it's later, sorry, if it's earlier than December 27, 2019, print this, otherwise print their regular text. Um, so that's good. Uh, and you can use uh, conditionals if you have one trigger that and different libraries want different text, you can use conditionals to give them that. Uh, so for org unit 58, they get this text. 
Org Unit 67 gets this text, uh, and everybody else gets this one. Um, okay, preferred names. Um, when the preferred name development was done, uh, the preferred names were made available to action triggers, but um, generally, action triggers don't get updated because people customize them so much. Um, so we've updated our action triggers to always use the preferred name, or if there isn't one, use the first name, same with the last name. Uh, and next is on our notices, we always, whenever we, we print a call number, we always include prefix, suffix, and parts. So, this is um, this call number piece there is what wraps that all in. Uh, and in order to make sure all the data is there, here's what you need to have in your environment to get that. <clears throat> okay, um, so those are my examples. I have some references that I just want to point out that they're here. Uh, and I also had added some wish list bugs just to gather them all together um, but i don't have to go through those slides uh, so i'd like to if there are other questions that we can address i'd like to do that now so any questions um, you all type your questions in if you have them. I'll just review. Um, Meg said she really liked the don't bite off more than evergreen can chew <laughs> reference because and and we all have probably done that yes. <laughs> at one time or another. <laughs> um, and then there's been some chat about PG admin three versus PG admin four. Um, so so there are some links in there to the desktop app and the browser. Um, let's see. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Andrea posted another <laughs> cheers for your table linking slide. <laughs> Everybody liked that. <laughs> well, I'm glad. <laughs> I do like the couch hero <laughs> idea. That's great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Blake said, show it again. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go back there. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, Benjamin says, thank you. This has been very helpful. I, I know I've learned some things. Oh, good. Uh, uh, speaking for myself. This way. There it is. This is a couch show. Yep. Jane says also. Yeah, and Taryn, Taryn says she uh, they've had to change a lot of theirs to run once a day to re reduce server load. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. And I can see where how you know having the uh, filter that you all used might might really save on running you know twenty versus running 20 triggers, you know, separately. So I like yeah. that idea a lot. <laughs> Blake said, thanks, Michelle. Good to hear your voice outside of IRC. Great presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany says, great job. Jeremiah said, in the middle of retroactively creating trigger events, for an event underscore definition that has been turned off and resetting others to go again with a change template joy. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had a lot of that, of course, with uh, the various changes with uh, COVID-19 as well. Yes, so. yes. It's been, a, it's been an opportunity to, to be creative with, with triggers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, Taryn says plus one. Thank you, Michelle. Jessica says, super helpful. Jason says, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, before we go, I just wanted to um, point out, uh, in, in terms of finding paths for uh, the environment, um, I struggled with that for a long time. Um, but if you, if you use these links, um, you can get a web representation of your field mapper. Um, and it will let you trace the, you still need to put on your glasses, but it will let you easily trace the, well, not easily. <laughs> it will let you trace the paths to find for your environment. <clears throat> a 
Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Good stuff.